third wave of positioning school is about development of empirical propositions. If you remember that the first was about roots in the military literature, the military strategy literature, and second was about the rise of consultant imperatives. Now this is about empirical propositions. What is actually this wave all about? This wave actually began in 1970s and its main emphasis was on that for determining the position of a firm it is important to collect and analyze the data from the industry. Since you remember that the positioning school is inspired from IO perspective, industrial organizational view, under which the organization's position is determined by the actors in the industry. So this wave was about collecting the real-time data in the industry, analyzing that data, and based on that, then aiming at a position. Michael E. Porter is considered to be the main person behind this wave. His two main books, Comparative Strategy and Comparative Advantage, actually furthered this wave. And Michael E. Porter has contributed many things to the world in general and to the literature of strategy in particular. Among all his contributions, a very important contribution is his Five Forces model. I am sure that you have some knowledge about this model. I'm not clear that whether you are able to use this model or not. But unless we discuss this model, this five forces model, we cannot understand the third wave in the positioning school. Let us have a look of the five forces model. Actually, Michael E. Porter proposed that there are five forces in the industry which determine the position for an organization. In other words, you can say that after analyzing these five forces, a firm can aim its position as its strategy. You remember that the Michael E. Porter takes strategy as a point of difference, strategy as a distinguished position of a firm. In his views, these five forces not only determine the position of a firm in the industry, but also the profitability potential of the industry. These five forces are industry competitors, and this force is also known as intensity of rivalry or intensity of rivals. That how many competitors are there? The second force is the threat of new entrants. Now, what is the possibility that more new firms, competitors are actually those who are already existing in the market, in the industry. And what is the possibility of the new firms to enter in? More there is a possibility of the new firms to enter into the industry, more would be the competition there and lesser the industry would become attractive. And he argued that the threat of new entrants depends on the entry barriers we'll be talking about shortly. The third force is the threat of substitutes. I hope that you are able to differentiate between the competing products and the substitute products. Just for your better understanding, I take a couple of examples here. See, in the beverages industry, Coke and Pepsi are competitors. 
because they produce a similar products whereas shazan juice nestle juice jam shiri roo afsa are the substitute products mean petrol stations are competitors in alternative fuels like lpg and cng are the substitutes different taxi services may currently you see that uber and kareem they are competitors al burak taxi service they are competitors but the omni bus service it's a substitute or personal cars or motor bikes are the substitutes i hope it is clear so he considered the threat of substitutes as a third important force more is there threat of substitutes more would be the life tough for the organization and less the industry will become attractive the fourth important force is bargaining power of buyers that how well the buyers can bargain compared to your firm if their bargaining power is higher there would be less profit potential if their bargaining power is lower there is more profit potential for the firm and the bargaining power of buyer is also dependent on certain factors we'll talk about shortly here just to make things clear i will give you an example take the case of telecommunication industry in pakistan currently the negotiating position of buyers is better than the firms that's why the firms are forced to operate at very lower profits and you have witnessed that recently a one player alwarid was taken over by another player mobile link this is the result of the better bargaining power of the buyers who forced the companies to shut down their operations and the fifth force is bargaining power of suppliers if bargaining power of suppliers is better there are lesser chances for more profitability for the firm if the case is otherwise things can be okay now let us discuss these forces one by one to fully understand the positioning school of thought entry barriers mean the threat of new entrants depends on the entry barriers of the firms these are the entry barriers economies of scale proprietary product differences brand identity switching cost capital requirements access to distribution these all are the factors which can increase or decrease the possibility of new entrants for example if there are higher capital requirements you see that in pakistan there are only four automobile operators because setting up an automobile manufacturing plant is not a child play it requires huge investment huge capital that's why there is less threat of new entrants compared to this in the two wheeler sector lesser environment investment is required that's why there are many two wheelers or motor bike producers in pakistan now absolute cost advantage access to necessary information proprietary low cost government policy expected retaliation these all are the points we don't currently have the luxury to go in the detail of every point but these all the points if these are plus there are lesser chances for the new firms to enter resultantly less competition but if these points are on the negative side mean that these these barriers are low the new firms can enter i just cite an example for you how many burger and shawarma shops are in the market so many because for opening up a burger and shawarma shop there is there are fewer entry barriers but how many home appliances manufacturers few because setting up the home appliances industry 
or an organization requires a lot of capital and there are other requirements as well. Now, what determines the rivalry among the firms? Industry growth. If industry is growing, there would be more rivals. Fixed cost value added. If the fixed cost is higher, there would be less competitor. If lower, there would be more. Intermittent overcapacity. If there are periods of overcapacity, this can also affect the number of players. Product differences. If product differences are more, there would be less rivals. If product differences are less, mean product is more generic, there could be many operators in the market. Switching cost. If switching cost is low, there can be more players, rivals if high, there can be less number of players in the market. Information complexity, diversity of competitors, corporate stakes, exit barriers. There are not only entry barriers, there are also exit barriers. For example, you set up a huge textile mill. Shutting down a retail store in the town has no barriers. You can do it at very low loss. But shutting down a huge textile factory will cost you a lot. So this is a great exit barrier. The point to make is, if these determinants are there, there would be less rivals. If these are not, there would be more rivals. More rivals mean more competition, less profitability. Now these are the determinants of the buyer power. Bargaining leverages and price sensitivity are the two categories. Just go through. Buyer concentration versus firm concentration. A simple example. Just take the example of the automobile industry. There are hundreds or thousands of buyers of the cars, but there are only three players. This is the very reason the players are charging the price of their choice and they are offering delivery of their products at their own selection rather than at the demand of the buyer. Whereas in case of banks, now the bank's outreach is more than the number of people who want to use the bank. So the services of the banks are less expensive. Then buyer volume. If buyers buy in the larger volumes, their bargaining power would be good. If less volumes in single units, then the firm's bargaining power would be good. Buyer information, ability to draw backward, integrate, substitute products, pull through, price total purchases, product differences, brand identity, impact on quality performance, buyer profit, decision makers incentive. These all are the points. If I just start discussing things, this can be a discussion of hours and we don't have the luxury for that. The point to make is this, that these points actually determine the buyer power. If buyer power is higher, the firm would be in trouble. If buyer power is lower, the firm would be in benefit. Now, determinants of supplier power. Differentiation of inputs. Switching cost. Almost all the factors which apply in case of the buyer power, they also apply in case of the supplier power. Say if buyers are few of some, some items, buyers are few and suppliers are few and buyers are many, the firms would be in benefit and vice versa is also true. Then the last point is determinants of substitute threat. Relative price performance of substitutes, switching cost, buyer propensity to substitute. Mean if the substitutes performance is better, price performance is better, it's a great threat for you. Or if switching costs are low, this is also a problem for you. And if the buyers easily switch to the substitutes, when they start preferring roofs over coke, then this is a problem for coke and the cola products. So in the nutshell, dear scholars, 
the positioning schools third way which is based on the empirical evidence it argues that these are the five forces in the market which determine the position of a firm hope it is clear to you thank you very much